wouldn't it be great if I could get my ideas and my thoughts out of my head and send them out to you perfectly in every single situation? But unfortunately, that's not always the case. See, language can help us communicate our thoughts through the process of encoding, but even language in itself has some challenges and some barriers. For example, meanings change over time. So if we look at the word nice, today it's a compliment. It means that you're agreeable, that you're polite, that you're friendly. The early versions of nice mean that you are simple, that you are silly, or even that you're foolish. Doesn't quite sound like a compliment, does it? Another reason we have a challenge is that new words are constantly being created. Whether that be because new technologies are out there and we have to give terms for that new technology, or different groups in pop culture are giving new terms for new ideas. Sometimes there are combinations of words that are created, such as hangry, being hungry and angry at the same time. Usually being angry because you're hungry. That new word filled in some gap that hungry and angry together just couldn't feel, but the combination made sense. Then there's slang. Slang is the language that we use with our peers. When I say what's up, you may know that what's up does not mean literally what is above you right now, like the ceiling or the sky. You know that it means what's happening, what's going on in your life. But if you're not a part of that peer group or that cultural group, then you're not going to understand the slang. Same thing goes with jargon. Jargon relates more to business culture. Take, for example, the medical profession. People who work in the medical profession have terms and phrases that they use that most of, most of us don't understand and need to be explained what this term or this phrase actually means to actually get it. That's an example of jargon. Also think about different regionalisms that we have. I know I was talking to someone and they said, man, I just need a cold pop right now. And I thought, pop, P-O-P, -P, pop. What do they mean? It took me a good 20 minutes of having this conversation for me to realize, oh, they mean a soda. But here where I live in the South, we don't ever say pop. We say soda, or we probably say Coke, to refer to soft drinks. Then there are euphemisms, like Grandma Kicked the Bucket. You may be aware that Grandma Kicked the Bucket doesn't mean she actually kicked an actual bucket. It means that Grandma passed away, that she died. But euphemism softens the blow. So, oh, your fish went to the great fishbowl in the sky. Again, it softens the blow of what actually happened. But at times, people may not understand the euphemism. Then there's the idea of style switching, or even code switching. So you may experience this with your friends who know multiple languages. They may be speaking one language to you, and all of a sudden switch. That's a clear example of code switching. But it also happens at a co-cultural level as well. So here's an example of a non-verbal code switch. You notice there's a handshake. Followed by kind of a bro hug there. We see different co-cultural aspects. There's more of a formal situation. Need to extend my hand versus less formal. And then there's even muted group theory. Muted group theory refers to the idea that some people may not feel like they can speak in certain environments. So this may mean that the one guy in a group full of women may not feel like he can talk about guy issues because there are so many women who are just going to out-talk him or tell him that he's wrong. This could also be the case for the one woman in the room 
with a man filled space. And there's also some barriers, such as indiscrimination. Now this is a very different topic than what most have seen. Indiscrimination is when we actually generalize people. When we say, well, all people do this. All men, all women, all people of this particular group do this one thing. So it's a form of stereotyping through our language. So if you were to say all redheads are fiery, that would be a form of indiscrimination. You're not showing how they're different. But if you were to say, based on experience and research, 75% of redheads are fiery, that would be a more accurate term, a more accurate opinion. Then there's polarization, where you have people pitted against one idea and the other. So do you like that person or do you hate that person? Well, maybe they don't like the person, but maybe they don't hate the person either. Maybe they're somewhere in the middle. When you polarize, immediately you make people think of two options only. Liking someone or hating someone. And they're more likely to say, well, I like that person. Or I'm more likely to say, they hate that person. Then there's discriminatory language. Again, all the is language. From being ableist, to racist, to sexist, to heterosexist, to ageist, the list goes on, but language that makes somebody feel as though they're inferior. Now, with all these challenges, all of these barriers, you may be thinking, well, how can I have good language skills? How can I use my verbal communication for the better? Well, here are some guidelines for dialogic language. Make sure that you use inclusive language. So, one point I said, call your local congressman. And I corrected myself and I said, call your lo local congressperson. Because if I just said congressman, then it may make some people feel like there's only men in Congress. But we know there's also women in Congress. So using inclusive language makes sure that everyone feels like they're included and doesn't single anybody out. Also, think about avoiding profanity. So we know that profanity is a vulgar, irreverent language that people usually find offensive. Make sure that you limit your level of profanity. Understand how it may color people's perspective of you. Avoid hate speech. So we know profanity is not the only type of language that people find offensive. So targeting or even attacking someone based on their gender, their sexual orientation, their ethnicity, their race, their religion, some group that they categorize themselves under is really harmful. It does not encourage dialogue. What about those cultural metaphors? Be aware of how you use culturally appropriate metaphors as well. For example, if you say, oh, she's a dime, which is a new phrase I've been hearing a lot. Well, when you say the word dime, think about the fact that a dime is American currency. So someone who isn't originally from America, who doesn't have familiarity with that currency, may not really get the meaning. Try to use familiar language. So don't just try to use the big words to sound fancy or smart, right? Use words that are familiar to you because it can create a negative impression if you use words in, in an inappropriate way or mispronounce them. Make sure that when you're describing something that you're specific and concrete. So no one really likes someone dancing around the issue, right? Especially here in the U.S. where we are a low-context culture, we want the details. Remember to give people accurate descriptions, to give them vivid examples. Especially when you're telling a story 
or giving a speech, paint a picture with your words. Help people see it in their mind. Now when you're describing something, make sure to use descriptive language, not a violative language. So if you come into the classroom late and I say, oh, I noticed that you're five minutes late, you must not really care about this class. Well, that's not me being just descriptive, right? I'm evaluating your actions based on some perception. Maybe there's a reason why you were late. Maybe there was traffic. Or maybe you had a sick kid that you were taking care of. But make sure that you stay descriptive. Don't just start assuming. And one thing that your textbook did not mention that I want to point out, take turns. Any good conversation, any good dialogue, is going to make sure that everyone feels included. That it's not a monologue where only one voice is represented. By taking turns, you're encouraging people to take the roles of speaker and listener in a conversation. So now I hope you have a better understanding of what language is. That you understand different characteristics of language and what makes it so confusing, at times challenging even, but things that we can do to improve our communication overall. So maybe we are not Romeo and Juliet dealing with roses and trying to call them by any other name, but we see from our examples that language by any other name would still be a very vital part of our communication.